which is, uh, we'll be looking at this morning. Good morning and welcome to Good Morning Nigeria. I'm Rhoda Obu. And I'm Kingsley Osadolo. I join my colleague Rhoda in welcoming you to, to this edition of the program, reaching you as always live on the network service of the Nigerian Television Authority. In the course of the program, if you are one of our regular viewers, of course, you know what to expect. There will be a newspaper review, there will also be business uh, coming presently, and sports and foreign. We have a number of stories out of the Rio Olympics. We are kicking off with the news now, and here is our newscaster, Ronke Kolaole. Hi, Ronke. Hello, Kingsley, and welcome to the news. Political leaders in Guinea-Bissau have been urged to take the path of honor by embracing unity and caution in the management of the nation's affairs. President Muhammadu Buhari gave the advice while exchanging views with the special representative of the UN Secretary General on Guinea-Bissau, Mudibo Tore. State House correspondent Adam Sambo reports that President Muhammadu Buhari said Nigeria will not shirk in its responsibility of ensuring peace, unity, and stability in West Africa despite the prevailing hardship. He, however, said increased support will be required from ECOWAS and the United Nations towards achieving the desired objectives. Our strategic meeting aimed at confronting with greater impetus the prevailing challenges of security and socio-economic well-being of Nigerians has ended in Abuja. State House correspondent Adamu Sambo reports that issues relating to terrorism, insurgency, militancy, and threat of flooding dominated discussions. The meeting reassured Nigerians of the resolve of the federal government to secure the release of the Chibok girls. What is important to government is the safety and security of these girls. There are a few things you need to do behind the scene which you cannot make public. But what I can assure is that the government is committed to doing everything to rescue these girls. If I say we are speaking, we are engaging them, I'm speaking for a position of authority. So for us, it's not just because they release a video is because it, we believe that there will be no final closure to Boko Haram until and when we're able to resolve the issue of these girls. Nigeria is again collaborating with the United States of America in the area of security. This time, the fora is in form of joint country action plan that will help standardize policies and operations. Waziri Zayan reports that a United States team of experts in specialized security roles are in the country to engage their Nigerian counterparts on strategy, delineating specific roles and responsibilities for specific situations. This is not the first meeting. This is uh, a meeting that is going to consolidate the previous meetings we've had. And of course, uh, we've already identified the focused areas. The federal government has launched a new agriculture policy for 2016 to 2020. Vice President Yemi Oshibajo at the launch described agriculture as the arrowhead that will put the country's economy back on sound footing. Titled The Green Alternative, the agriculture promotion policy is aimed at refocusing the nation on agriculture to meet domestic food requirements and export potential. There is no way we can do the scale of agricultural production, both for domestic consumption and export, without ensuring local improved seedling development alongside those that we import. And of course, encouraging the work of the agencies of the ministries of science and technology. And we're inviting all of you, whether you are now in the civil service, in the military, or the police, whatever it is you're doing, please think of investing in agriculture. And still on agriculture, the federal government says it will not make any definite statement on the application of genetically modified organisms, GMOs, until all scientific evidence is thoroughly examined. This position was taken at an expert meeting on biosafety and technology in relation to GMOs held in Abuja. The interface provided robust deliberation on whether or not to adopt GMOs in agriculture. 
In between the fears, the suspicions, and the reality lies the truth. We depend on you to let us know where the truth lies. If we should embrace it, we will. If we shouldn't, we won't. But between us, the ministers, we do not lay claim to full knowledge on this subject, and we will never make any statements until we have the scientific evidence available to us. From uh, experiences gone by, some of our um, institutes, like the National Root Crop uh, Research Institute, have concluded a first phase uh, research in biofortified cassava um, enhanced with pro-vitamin A. There's been so much that we've done already, and I think we need to remember it was done here, and it was done uh, to, to further the interest of food security that's safe for, for everyone. When that is ongoing, government's bid to use agriculture in diversifying the economy is tilting towards cotton production. Musa Abubakar in Far Away Gombe State, however, reports that to achieve this goal, the early cotton industry in Gombe will require more than the proverbial short in the arm. We are talking about diversifying the Nigerian economy. The agricultural sector is key to it. And the textile industry is key. We need to sit, put it to plant. And now to the National Assembly, where the Senate Committee on Innovation has mandated all agencies and parastatus in the sector to propose amendments to their acts that will facilitate the unbundling of the sector in line with international best practices. An interactive session between the committee and heads of the aviation agencies and parastatus provided the platform for this. Muhammad Ali reports that Chairman Senate Committee on Aviation, Senator Adama Alero, led other members in discussion with heads of the aviation agencies and parastatals. It is very embarrassing for foreign airlines to be going to neighboring countries to foil before coming into Nigeria. Uh, despite the fact that uh, we are an oil producing nation and um, we promise that uh, we will look into this problem and we will do our very best to find a solution to it. Nowhere will you succeed if you want to operate outside the rule of engagement that is known in the industry. And to other news now. Undigbo and Nigerians at home and in the diaspora have been charged to support talent development, creative ideologies, dividends of democracy and good governance in order to actualize the desires for a better Nigeria. This, among other requests, were made by Ohaneza Indigbo students during a World Press Conference in solidarity with President Buhari's administration. Ohaneza Indigbo students like you shall vehemently oppose any attempt to tarnish the hard-earned image and integrity of this noble general, who all his life is serving Nigeria as a first-class security material. So we are stating categorically that the present administration, led by President Muhammadu Buhari, is assiduously working hard towards promoting and restoring the dignity and integrity of the nation's lost glory, which are in line with the dreams, visions, and missions of our founding fathers. Elsewhere, 23 prison officers have been dismissed, with 11 others suspended by the Civil Defense, Fire, Immigration and Prison Services Board for their complicity in the escape of prisoners from Kujay Medium Security and Kotun Karafe prisons. The dismissal was contained in a letter signed by the Secretary to the Board, which considered serious misconduct and negligence of duty levied against the affected officers. Prison, DCP Okonko Lawrence, and 10 others have been suspended over the recent prisoner's escape from the prison. And that is the news for Good Morning Nigeria. We thank you for being there. And I'll hand you over to Kingsley and Rhoda for the continuation of the program. All right, thank you very much, uh, Ronka Kalawule, for uh, the news. Of course, uh, we're taking a short break now when we return from the break. It will be time for us to take our business package. If you hear a bomb explosion or gunshots of an active shooter, that might be a terror attack. At such times, always remember three action words. Run, hide, report. Don't try to run towards the terror scene to save the situation because there might be a second bomb blast or another attack. Run far away and take cover. 
Make sure you are safe first. Yes, it is in our nature to sympathize over the hurt. But remember, only trained personnel can help in such situations. When in a secured environment, promptly call relevant authorities and help will come. For anonymous reporting, call 09630-3250 to 5 or 0813-2222-106. If you see something, say something. Nigeria, unite against terrorism. This message is brought to you by the Federal Ministry of Information and Culture. A hectic lifestyle or overeating can cause a burning pain in your chest. That's harmful. Take Gaviscon. One dose relieves in three minutes to soothe the pain of heartburn. It goes straight to the source to work for hours, providing long-lasting relief. That's why I recommend Gaviscon. I recommend Gaviscon. Gaviscon, fast relief you can actually feel. If symptoms persist after three days, consult your doctor. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching Good Morning Nigeria on the network service of the NTA. On business news, political economy watchers say concerted efforts amongst African leaders is a panacea for continental economic development. Sheo Guli has more on our business news package. Africa has the potential to do more than its current capacity if it uses its vast human and natural resources judiciously. Former Nigerian President Ulisha Gumabasonjo expressed this view at the sideline of an economic forum. Citing the case of West African trade integration, the former president called for the removal of unnecessary bottleneck hindering free and easy movement of goods and services within the sub-region. I, I call it non-tariff non-tariff barriers, uh, it's too much. And we just have to get our leaders to say, look, enough is enough. This should stop. I believe that the custom post between our two countries should only do one thing, register the number of vehicles and register the goods that are passing so that we have record. Other than that, there should be no other hindrance or obstacle. Register the number of uh, the vehicles, registered goods that are moving in or out. He identified concerted effort among African leaders as panacea for continental economic development. Whatever we try to do nationally, we have to carry it beyond the national level to the sub-regional level, and indeed to the continental level. And until we are able to do that, we aren't going to uh, be there. For an unprecedented development on the continent, the former president said the role of peace, security, and stability cannot be wished away. The Nigerian Communications Commission, NCC, has empowered subscribers to choose the text messages they receive from telcos through its directive on Do Not Disturb DND Code. Its Deputy Director of Consumer Affairs, Mr. Femi Atoyebi, who responded to consumers' complaints at a consumer town hall meeting organized by the regulator in Lagos, said the meeting was to educate subscribers about their rights and privileges. Atoyebi said the DND code is all about stopping unwanted text messages saying consumers 
at liberty to subscribe to service or product, adding that there is also liberty to unsubscribe. And finally, on the foreign scene, Japan's economy grew at a weaker than expected rate in the second quarter despite an aggressive spending policy by the government. Gross domestic product grew at an annualized rate of 0.2% in the three months to June, below market forecast of 0.7% and a marked slowdown from the 2% in the first quarter. The figures come after the government launched a massive new stimulus package worth 28 trillion yen. Japanese stock fell after the data. The benchmark Nikkei 225 share index dropped 0.3% on concerns that Asia's second largest economy will continue to struggle. On top of Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's fiscal stimulus, Japan's central bank is running negative interest rates on an unprecedented asset purchase program. And that's the package on the business news for now. Thanks for watching. Show will go leave there for us on business. Time now to take a look at uh, stories uh, on, on the front pages of uh, Sub Daily's newspaper review. Is up next. Domini Oden, our reviewer, is here with us this morning for today's edition of the Super Review. Hi, Omini. Good morning and welcome Good morning. to the program. Pleasure being here. Good morning. All right. So let's uh, begin our review this morning with uh, This Day newspaper. This Day newspaper has as its late story, Defense Chief. That's the key card. Decision on Chibok girls and Boko Haram prisoner swap is political. The line is below the photograph that you are seeing there on uh, your screen. It has a writer, uh, journalist declared wanted, asks Ami to buy him ticket. That's to say, journalist declared wanted, asks Ami to buy him ticket. Uh, that's uh, Ahmed Sarkida, uh, Sarkida. And Aisha Wakil and Bolori turned themselves in. Uh, that's the other writer to that headline. Now, below that is another headline that says, you are no longer a military ruler, Oba of Lagos, tells Buhari, details on page nine. Now, also on the front page, beside uh, the photograph you see there on the front page, it's a political story. It says, PDP to proceed with convention despite conflicting court orders. And party screens, George and De Niro and Dupesi for chairmanship position, uh, for chairmanship election. Above the name flag, two headlines. EFCC probes junk over alleged missing funds. That's on page 12 in greater detail. And... Uh, what would then be the second lead story above that says, Kachuku, that's the kicker. Nigeria will need extra 900,000 barrels per day to recover oil lost to militancy. And says, Chippewa girls are not less valuable than oil facilities, and crude rises to $47 on OPEC Russia output cap talks. Uh, the Daily Trust now. The Daily Trust just below the name flag says, Court stops PDP convention. Uh, more details on page 37. And uh, just beside that, Salkida, Wakil, Bolori, we are not on the run. That's on page 3. And the big story on the Daily Trust concerns over active and register SIM cards. And uh, if you go down below, you would see uh, 23 prison officers sacked, 11 suspended over jail breaks. That's on page 6. And page 4 of the Daily Trust. We're running out of patience with Buhari's government, says Asu. Finally, all prices rise, but excess looms. Omini? Okay. Uh, the, the, the big story, and we will get to that, uh, the concern by the chief of defense staff, uh, Abayomi Olani Shakin, he has said that the onslaught on uh, Boko Haram will be sustained and reinforced, and that any move to do any swap is political and that would be strictly a political decision. Like the papers have clearly explained that the conflicting news has been the, the, the Nigerian army said if the wanted persons do not present themselves, they will be declared wanted. They have not been declared wanted yet. So they have, the three persons have not flouted the order. They have presented themselves, though one of them, the journalists who is based in Dubai, 
says he was out of the country, but his quick return will be activated if he gets a ticket from the military. Uh, the Nigerian uh, the Nigeria Defense uh, Civil Defense Fire Immigration and Prison Service yesterday came out with a, an order by dismissing 23 officers and suspending 11 others. Uh, three senior officers in Kuje Medium Security Prisons, three from Khartoum Cafe, seven junior officers from Kuje, 10 junior officers in Khartoum Cafe, and 11 from Musuka Prisons have gone. And you, you know very well that recently we have had spits of uh, jail Jill breaks. Breeze. And according to the report, this is to serve as deterrent to others. And uh, we believe, too, the other side of it, which the papers have said is we hope in taking this step, other measures will be taken to ensure that the prisons are properly fortified and secured. You, you, you agree with me that some of the prisons are as old as when they were established. Mm -hmm. So over time, the security arrangement there have been overtaken with technology and what have you. So they need to update them while they are also taking steps to ensure that officers are on their heels to do their job. Courts of coordinate jurisdiction yesterday passed conflicting judgments. Well, <laughs> it is the position of the judiciary to interpret the laws. The parties say they will go ahead with the con convention, but the bottom line is that uh, they described the protocol judgment which came before as interlocutory and the FCC judgment as interim. But I have not the legal minority to interpret the implication of it, but the concerns are that if the if the convention goes ahead tomorrow, does not go ahead, what are the legal implications at the end of the day? Maybe we'll take other stories. Well, yeah, that's right, Tom. I mean, uh, well, let's uh, take other stories. I'm sure the, uh, the party, that's the PDP and the factions, have their legal consultants. The issue of injunction, these are uh, what you call uh, equitable reliefs. You know, there's a difference between an interim injunction and interlocutory injunction, but it's not a law class, so uh, <laughs> we move on to the headlines that we're reading. From Vanguard newspaper, uh, again, just the lead story has to do with uh, the Chibok girls. says, why military can't uh, swap terrorists for Chibok girls? That's the, the one that Domini has already described, but there are a number of uh, writers to that. It says, wanted man to Nigerian army, I'm ready to meet you in Abuja. And Bolori returns to Amir Barracks in Meduguri, and woman declared wanted sub itself to military and U.S. to send FBI team to uh, Nigeria. Now, two, there are other headlines relating to the economy and land matters on the front page of Vanguard. Naira dips against dollar as oil prices as oil price rises to forty-eight dollars and five cents. Naira dips against dollar as oil price rises to forty-eight dollars and five cents. And inflation to rise further to 17.2% in July. Uh, details of that can be found on page 19. Of course, uh, the last figures we had for inflation at the end of June uh, came to 16.5%. Yes. Now, this is a speculation that it might hit 17.2% uh, in July. Also, there on the front page, but in greater detail on page 40, Ambode signs anti land grabbing bill into law, unbody signs anti land grabbing bill into law. And then the PDP story is also there. But inside, uh, there are stories. You have uh, former President Lucia Gumo Basinger uh, indicating why, uh, this is on page 41, for instance, says 1976 coup. You might not be able to see that on the front page, but on the, uh, on the screen, rather. Why I declined taking over after Motala Mohammed's death. This is attributed to uh, former President Lucia Gumo Basinger. Of course, he eventually took over, uh, and then he was uh, military head of state up until 1979. That's right. All right. Uh, on the nation, it also leads with uh, what we have seen in uh, other papers. Mama Boko Haram, Bolori gives self up to military. <coughs> and uh, below that is a rider swapping of girls with insurgents. Political decision, says CDS. But just above the name flag, Plato's cash, government petitions agencies that you get on page seven. Gunmen kill six in Kaduna village attack. Police says we are in control. You get more details on page 43. And on page six, court gives conflicting rule on PDP. Judge Blast Obi. Uh, I think that's the much we can take it, it, on the nation. Nation, yeah. Rhoda, I mean, as I said, there are some stories on the inside pages. Uh, page 41 again of Vanguard says, my removal, act of God, says ex jam registrar. That's on page 41. And then on page 40 of Vanguard, says Asu 
kicks against Oloyode's appointment as jam registrar? <laughs> How many? The, the story I almost missed is the, the, the warning by Daily Trust on NCC to sit up. You know, the reasons for the SIM registration exercise that took place recently in Nigeria, yeah. which even slammed uh, a, a fine on one of the big uh, service providers, uh, was on grounds of security, uh, insurgency, and what have you, fraud. So if a national daily is coming up with the fact that the issue of pre-registered SIMs are active again, it means NCC should go back to the drawing board should go back to, maybe they need to activate their M&E mechanism, the monitoring and evaluation, to be sure that the service providers are compliant because they warn that henceforth, after the last exercise, we should not have cases of pre-SIM registration, pre-SIM uh, SIM that are not registered being, being active, active, that it must be registered and properly coded before it is active. So it's a, it's a warning to NCC to sit up on that. But the big one, uh, Kisley, during Operation Feed the Nation, I was still a child. During the Green Revolution, I, I, at least I was an adult then. Uh, yesterday, the federal government launched the, the Green Alternative, the new agricultural roadmap. And from the package, it looks quite participatory. And uh, down the line, all the tiers of government are involved. Uh, it will involve. And what the government is saying is that part of the problem is that we keep importing what we have comparative advantage to produce. So if the message, and if you heard the Minister of Agriculture, he said, everybody, I remember, very, very, let me be very personal here, my dad was active in service, but had a farm. Every Saturday we went to farm. So maybe government workers should imbibe the culture of trying to go to farm. Somebody told us a story that a consultant to the agricultural sector for years lost his job, and just weeks after, he became hungry. He didn't even have a stick just a garden at his backyard, a consultant to agriculture for over 20 years. So imagine that somebody who was in the agricultural sector had no farm. So these are the messages. But the, the, the package looks quite promising because already good digit and that the Bank of Agriculture in tandem with CBN are to be overhauled to ensure that this works out clearly. So it's a good uh, action by the government to really activate the diversification policy of the present administration. Well, that's fine. I mean, thank you very much. Just the issues there, uh, there are pre-existing policies. How does this a new agenda square with the pre-existing policies in terms of access to credit, in terms of insurance for farmers, and so on? So I'm sure those are details that we we'll said that yeah. uh, some of the policy stands taken by the previous administration that are quite novel will be carried along on the green, uh, and, the new agricultural roadmap. And the other point, you know, just as a joke, you said you were a child during uh, Operation Feed in Asia, yes. and then you were an adult during the Green Revolution. Exactly. But well, there was only just, uh, it was a transition. Op Operation Feed in Asia was 76 to 79, yes. and Green Revolution <laughs> was 79 to 83. The present looks look, look quite robust and... Uh, it has some I element of uh, possibility. Another, uh, another troubling story, this time sports back page. Stay away from us on that 23 Eagles tell that long. All right. <laughs> Many, that's the much that we can take. Uh, Thank you so much. This segment. We'll see you again uh, sometime. All right. We'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll be dealing with our principal item for discussion today. That's to say, unpaid salaries and pensions of local government employees. Nigerians. Suicide bombers are not spirits. They are not ghosts. They are human beings like you and me. They live amongst us. They are your neighbors. They are your friends today, but terrorists tomorrow. So you must know your neighbor now. Security begins with you and me. Know your neighbor. Be vigilant. Be security conscious. Report suspicious persons, objects, and movements to the police and other security agencies. The security of our nation is a duty for you and me. If you see something, say something. Nigeria, unite against terrorism. This message is brought to you by the Federal Ministry of Information. Welcome back. You're still watching Good Morning Nigeria. Our focus this morning on paid salaries and pensions of local government workers. 
As with other unsavory experiences in Nigeria, the phenomenon of non-payment of local government workers' salaries doesn't look like it will disappear anytime soon. Hakmed Ambali, in this background report that would lay the foundation for our discussion this morning, looks at the plight of workers and why more than ever before those concerned need to adopt a more robust financial system that pays workers as it when due. Unpaid arrears, protest, hunger and despair. Words that have taken up permanent status in the local government workers' lexicon in Nigeria. And they don't look like they are ready to leave. From the days when there was surplus to now that the country is in a tight financial situation, workers at the level closest to the people have always borne the brunt of financial recklessness. If they are not being owed salaries, then it is arrears of pension long overdue. Never mind the fact that their funds come directly from the Federation accounts, many local governments grapple to pay staff salaries, especially that of teachers. As for executing projects of their own, that's a story for another day. The statistics are as depressing as they're embarrassing. One report says at least over 1,300 civil servants and retirees have died in most states of the Federation as a result of hunger, sickness and frustration over unpaid wages. The overall effect of this is a work first low in morale but quick to high handedness and corruption. This trend only but alienates the people from those expected to serve their interest. While the conditions evoke pity, Observers wonder why, despite the bailouts given by the federal government to states, lamentations over unpaid wages still abound. Tackling the trend may require some form of financial prudence and greater commitment to the plight of these workers. But in the interim, more continue to languish in pain, hoping against hope itself that someday, before their sweat dries off, their labor will be appreciated. All right, uh, we'd like to thank you there for that background report. Now we have a number of guests with us here in the Abuja studios as well as at uh, other locations. We'll be joining them in the course of this conversation. At this time, we'd like to welcome Senator Kabir Gaya, who is a uh, former governor of Kano State and also former chairman, Senate Committee on States and Local Governments. Senator Gaya, it's our pleasure to have you on Good Morning Nigeria. Thank you, and Good Morning Nigeria. All right. Uh, also with us here in the Abuja studios, we would like to welcome uh, Mr. Iraba Kop. Iraba. Iraba Kop. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to use uh, this what we call linguistic interference at this time. It seems like Iraba, but it isn't Iraba. It's Iraba Kop Joshua. Iraba Kop Joshua is General Secretary of the National Union of Local Government Employees, Norge. Uh, Mr. Joshua, a pleasure to have you on Good Morning Nigeria. Good morning, Nigeria. Okay. All right. Uh, we have also with us uh, one of our regular guests. He is uh, Jubri Sabo Kiana. He is a former chairman, Kiana Local Government uh, uh, Council of Nasarawa State, a former Argon uh, chairman. It's, it's an honor to have you join us on the program this morning. Good morning. Um, it's my pleasure to. And also joining us via Skype is Mr. David Ederia. He is the Delta State Commissioner of finance and he will be joining us by SCAF from uh, Asaba. Thank you and welcome to the program. Yes, good morning. Thank you. Thank you, Rada. <laughs> All right, uh, let's uh, begin our discussion uh, this morning. Uh, it is something that we have been uh, witnessing across the country and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not a very uh, good situation where you have people who are in the third chair of government directly interacting, you know, who are being involved in the third chair of government who have direct, you know, who are supposed to have direct access to government being denied their salaries. So we're looking at the fact that what is responsible for this and what is the situation like generally uh, in states? Well, to be frank with you, thank you very much for being here on this program. Um, why the local governments have not been getting enough money to pay their salaries and wages for the workers on the site. I think it depends on two factors. One, the, the state government presently have been taken over the local governments as not a third tier of government, but just as appendix of the state. 
and that the amount that they were supposed to be receiving monthly, they have not been paying them. So therefore, most of these local governments are having problems in terms of liquidity or cash what is due. I remember some years back, I was the chairman of states and local government committee in the Senate, and we tried to make sure we give the local government an independence, free independence, direct access to their funds. Uh, but unfortunately, when we passed the resolution in the Senate, for the amendment of the Constitution, when we went to the states, it didn't work out. The governor did not support that resolution or that amendment for the act, and they're still under the mercy of their governors. But I believe majorly is that if the local governments could have their own autonomy and they could be independent, some of the local governments can survive. I think where we have problems are local governments within the metropolitan, whereby they're not able to generate enough revenue. Even the government, the state government, is taking much more of their revenue in that area than, than what they're supposed to. So I think if they could be encouraged to increase their uh, revenue generation and the state le those who are at the metropolitan level, and those at lower government level should also be encouraged. But if the state governments were given funding to the states, I mean to the local governments, I think we'd have better peace in this country. I remember when I was a governor in 91, 92, uh, the state governments were receiving their salary or their allocation directly. We, I mean, the, the local governments were receiving their allocation directly. We were not interfering. There was a time, I believe, we even had to borrow some money to others, to the local governments to generate some projects. I know of one local government in my own state, which is called the Wakim Kudu. They wanted to set an international market. So they took a loan from us as state government. And we gave them six million at that time, and they started the international market. It's now being organized as a very important and uh, international market in my state. So I could say that the issue is lack of encouragement by the states, and that when it comes to election, most of these uh, local government chairmen were just boys appointed or men appointed or women appointed by the governor. Therefore, they didn't strive hard to, be, to become a candidate of the party. They were just nominated, and since they know that the election in the states are just mere elections, uh, so they become uh, suspicious to the governors. Um, All right, so, so, so Rhoda, just before we uh, get back to the nitty gritty of the challenges of uh, payment of salaries, I think it's useful, and the question is going to the former chairman of Kiana Local Government uh, in Nasarawa State, that's Honorable uh, Jibril Sabo Kiana. First of all, when we say that local governments are facing the challenge of unpaid salaries and pensions, let's have an understanding. Who and who is on the payroll of a local government? Um, the payroll of a local government is uh, made up of uh, all the staffs that are employed by the local government council. And uh, both the, the current and recurrent expenditures and their entitlements are supposed to be paid by the local government council. But what, uh, what is obtainable is the structural defect that we have always spoken about in this program that relates to the status <coughs> of the constitution as we have it today. And uh, the problem is fundamental from the point of view of the inability of the leadership at the federal and the state governments to look at the issue of governance from the perspective which the constitution has prescribed where you have your responsibility as a first-tier government at the federal level, you have a responsibility as a second-tier government, as a state government, and that the third tier of government, which is the most fundamental uh, arm of government anywhere in the world, is being emas emasculated by these two arms of government to the detriment of the staff and the people of this country, and to that extent, the local government system is not functioning, and so the staff of the local government system have, have, have been denied the opportunity to grow, to become uh, proficient and efficient, to be able to discharge their responsibilities. So all the, uh, the staff in the, uh, in the local government, whether it is their pension, there's a pension, there's a local government pension fund, which is managed strangely by the provision of the constitution by a commission set up by the state, and uh, the salary are, pay, are supposed to be paid by local government. but. Everywhere in this country today is common knowledge that even the salaries of local government councils, their vouchers are being prepared in the Ministry of Local Government at the state level. So practically, the third tier of government has been killed by the governors or, and the officials and, and the operators of the third, um, second tier of government. So this is where the problem lies. Every day, we, they keep talking about pathetically, you know, Nolge is on the forefront with the chairman. The chairman is at the forefront.
is with the, uh, the operators of, at the second tier of government. And therefore, uh, if the local government system was allowed to thrive and to function as it were, I think uh, the issues that are perpetually coming up between the local government employees and their employers, which is the local government council, would have arisen. And, uh, and uh, it is that the local government system have been denied the op opportunity to discharge their obligations uh, properly. Well, thank you. I, I, I wanted you to elaborate on who and who sh is on the payroll of a, a local government. Yeah. Now, because sometimes you hear complaints. Some governors have said, look, we are not the ones who are owing you. And as you go back to a local government, if you say primary school teachers have not been paid, they say, no, that's not our responsibility. Go to a local government. Primary healthcare workers have not been paid. No, go back to a local government. I, I think some clarity is required okay. as to you know, who is on the payroll of a local government. No, all the, all the sectors that you have mentioned are on the payroll of the local government, except the primary school uh, teachers, who are supposed to be on the payroll of the local government, but cons uh, by the arrangement that we have today, the funds, let me make this clarification even from the beginning, the funds that are due to every local government in this country has a, a first charge uh, status of, uh, I mean, they, they, it has a first charge that is carried out from Abuja, from FAC meetings. All the salaries of all the primary school teachers in Nigeria are deducted from point A and sent directly to primary education boards at the state level, which are operated and organized and managed by staff of the state government. So there should have not been any reason why it, the teachers in, or primary school teachers in any state not having their salaries paid or their dues paid, or their allowances paid in any form. Because whatever is due to all primary school teachers from day one, even though they are in the, pro and the, in the, uh, in the recurrent and current expenditure of local government, their funds are deducted from source to be paid at uh, the primary school board. The primary health care uh, uh, staff are paid directly at local government. local government councils, and it is the local government councils that pay, and they pay also their allowances. So um, in principle, these people are staff and, and their staff and their responsibility is from the local government. So at no point should there be any reason why any um, staff of local government should go to a state governor or any other institution for his salary or his due. But for the fact that the local government system now knows that the state governors have emasculated the system, the local government system, and they know that their money is with the state government. The state government really operates what you call joint account, yeah, which is irregularly put in place because it is a misinterpretation of what is called joint account that is responsible for this problem. So all the funds that are due to all local governments in this country, today, or most local governments in this country today, are first of all deposited in a joint account operated solely by state governors. So maybe, I mean, by practice today, the local government staff have a right to go and ask for their money from the state government. But if the system were supposed to operate normally and uh, as it were expected by the constitution, there wouldn't have been an issue at all. So that's where the problem is. Thank you very much, uh, mm. Jibri Now You've mm. raised, itemized uh, some issues there, uh, the system issue, the issue of uh, the joint account. But we'll get back to you shortly. Let's uh, get to Iraq of, um, uh, Iraq of Joshua. You are the Secretary General of the Nigerian Union of Local Government Employees. Let's get a first-hand information on what the situation is like for local government workers across the country. Are all the states owing what states are owing? And how, how, how much and the months you know, that, that they seem to be owing, how large is it? Thank you very much. Uh, concerning the issue of uh, salary in the local government, the situation is very, very, very pathetic. Because no local government that a staff is not being owned. I, I didn't get that. There is no local government the, in the country right now no, that a staff is not there being is owned. There is no. Even, okay. Yes. The, the months ranges from six months to 18 months. Okay. Take for instance, in Edo State, it's about 18 months. Some local government are owing 
to workers in three months. And in some, look, in some states, the workers are paid haphazardly. Like in Kaduna State, you are owing 10 months, they'll come and give you one month. What of the remaining months? And it's not every worker that will be paid at the same time <coughs> that month. They will pick some and pay and leave some. Like in Nazareth State, they pay, pay them on percentages. How do they arrive at the percentage they are paying? Nobody knows. So there are so many ways the salary has been bastardized in the local government uh, councils. So, and we have been calling upon the state government to look into the issue of payment of salaries in the local government, and they are completely adamant. Some of them say we don't touch local government fund, which is a total lie. If you don't touch local government fund, why can't you ask the federal government to remit the money directly to the local government councils? If you know your hands are not there, you are not touching the money, let the money go direct to the people. All right, um, let's uh, get to um, Dave, Mr. David uh, Debe, who's a commissioner for finance in Delta State. Well, I'd like to ask you the question that Queen Kingsley asked uh, Jubril Kiana earlier. Who is responsible for the payment of local government workers? And a state like Delta State, what is the situation like, first of all, so that then a state like Delta, it's worrisome that you're owing local government staff? Uh, uh, thank you very much, Rhoda. I think we need to be very careful in what we say, and what we say should be based on facts. Um, when you say a state, uh, I, I hope you mean uh, the local government in Delta State is owing their staff or are owing their staff. The state, the state government does not pay for local government staff. They have they're a different tier of government, and therefore they they uh, are responsible for their staff and the payment of salaries of their staff. In the case of Delta State, in fact, we have been supporting our local governments to the tune of 677 million naira for months. Um, and in fact, we've also provided them loans, all in a bid to help pay their salaries, uh, to help the local governments pay their, pay their staff. So I think, it, I think we need to also be careful about making sweeping statements. Uh, just because uh, a situation applies in one state doesn't necessarily mean uh, it applies across board. Let me give you an example. Uh, someone made the statement earlier uh, that uh, uh, the states uh, uh, have hijacked the powers and functions of the local government. That's totally incorrect. Uh, in our state, the, the money that comes goes straight to the local governments. And you must have a state a, a joint local account. That is what the law says. And if we didn't have the account, where would we pay the 10% of our IGR, which we give to the local governments? So I think we need to be a little bit, I know it's an emotional issue, but we should stick to facts uh, and not uh, 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 make statements that are actually incorrect. I think uh, the main issue we should try and focus on is more of what can we do to solve the problem. And I'm very glad we have a senator. Uh, uh, with us this morning. Good morning, Mr. Se uh, uh, distinguished Senator. Uh, the question I'd like to ask you, uh, because the clear issue here is revenue. Government is all about management of resources, is revenue. And the, cl the clear question I'd like to ask is, why hasn't the revenue allocation formula been uh, uh, amended in line with the Constitution? <clears throat> We've been operating the same revenue allocation formula for over 30 years. And the Constitution is very clear in Section 162.2 that the revenue allocation formula should be updated at least every 10 years. Now, if we had amended that formula, it would have taken into account the current realities. It is very clear 
that the formula as is is not acceptable to most the, to the local government tier of government to the state tier of government definitely not the federal government takes 52 percent of revenue leaving about 47 48 percent to the uh, local governments and states it's clearly inadequate when you look at the roles and responsibilities that each tier of government uh, uh, is res responsible for and and it's taken it's been over 30 years Instead of us to address the real elephant in the room, we spend our time talking about what I call relative irrelevances. That is the issue that needs to be addressed, Mr. Senator. I'm sure you, you are aware of what I'm talking about, Mr. Senator. Because if we take a look at that formula and we actually match revenues to the powers and functions of each tier of government, I am sure we would not have the situation we have now where the local governments are totally emasculated. I totally agree uh, with the speakers on behalf of the local government earlier. They are totally emasculated. They have no money to do anything. It's not a recent problem, by the way. It has been existing for years. I, I, I did uh, uh, studies in this. It has existed for years in this country. So it's not a, a problem that started today. It has been a, in existence for a while. The only reason why it has come to the fore is because of the drop in revenue. It's like when the, uh, the tide moves back uh, in the sea. That's when you see where, where, where the real problems are on the beach. And that's what we're facing now. It is because of the current situation. All right. Uh, Chief uh, Adebia, thank you very much there for your comments. You've raised a number of points. You've also raised uh, a number of posers you know, for the other guests, particularly Senator uh, Gaia, who is here with us in the studios. We, we would like you to address this point. We're already dealing with it, so let's go to the meat of it. It is yet constitutionally stipulated that states and local governments will have a joint account, and you have stated that that's how uh, local governments you know, get their funding uh, through, lo uh, through uh, the, the state governments or from the state governments. But some commentators argue that the devil is in the detail. Yes, you have a joint account, but state governors are alleged to, from time to time, impose compulsory levies on local governments. They are compelled to sign a certain amounts off in every month, and these amounts are deducted from the joint accounts. And that's one of the reasons why you're having the Palos finances at a local government level. What's your comment? Uh, like I said, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Kingsley. Um, like I said earlier, I think we, we are focusing on issues that are not absolutely uh, the issues we should focus on. First of all, that statement, like I said, maybe other states should come and see how it really operates, uh, uh, should operate. And, and that's how it operates in Delta State. Which, how can you, it's like, I mean, it sounds preposterous and ridiculous to, 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 to even make that statement, honestly, because it's like saying President Buhari uh, imposes taxes and levies on state governors. We have different tiers of government, and each tier of government has its own uh, uh, head of government. The local government is a different tier of government. We never, in this state, uh, we have never done that to the best of my knowledge. And I am speaking from experience. I, I became commissioner of finance in this state in 1999. And for the first six years um, before I took a break and I have come back, I know the system we put in place and that is the system that is operating here. I really can't speak for any other state. So maybe other states need to come to Delta State to see how we actually operate it. We have a joint account because that's what the rules and the regulations say and the laws. Uh, so we have it. And, and in, in our case, in fact, we sit down every month, just like uh, as soon as we come back, back for a fact, the money is uh, transferred into the joint account. We sit down. In fact, it is as a result of our collaboration on a monthly basis that we are aware of the problems of the local government and we uh, use the opportunity to assist them. Um, so it's not correct to say that every state government, I think, it, I think we must emphasize that. When you talk about state governments, specify the state governments that do so. It is illegal for any state governor to impose a levy on any local governor. It is illegal. And if you are asked to do something that is illegal, why should you do it? Right. Uh, well, Chief, Chief Adebia, thank you again for your comments. Delta State is not uh, on the spot here. 
And where we, where, where we posed the question, you know, either using the analogy of commentators, we said some state governments or most state governments, and if you have 36 states, that would mean that you have some exception. Probably yours is one. And it is perhaps of the, because of uh, the apparent nuisance in joint accounts that some state governments have also gone ahead now to scrap such accounts, Kaduna, for example. But while you were speaking, uh, Honorable Kiana, who's been the chairman of a local government in Nasarawa State, you know, was itching to respond. The Honorable Kiana, let's get your reaction. Now, with due respect to the Honorable Commissioner, he is the one who is speaking from, from the blues, because even as a commissioner in his state, I'm sure he has the feel of what is happening in most of the states in the country. But even if, from his presentation, if I may be able to pick one or two words, once you begin to use the word as collaborate and see that in a joint account, like the, Mr. Kinsley said, the devil is in the details, with due respect. But also to state that the, ex, the, access, I mean, the essence of the joint account that continuously to be misinterpreted by state operators is, to the, is, the, is the bane of the problem we have. The joint account that is prescribed, if we must follow the spirit of the Constitution, does not say that all the funds that come to the, for, to the different local government accounts. Otherwise, if the federal government would have been the best place to interpret what is joint account, it would have sent the money in, in bulk to a joint account operated by the state. But what the federal government does is to state the dues of every local government to every local government. And now what the government, uh, state governors have done, done is to open an account where individual location to individual local governments are all paid into. The extent of which uh, joint account is existing is for the IGR, 10% generated by the state, to be shared based on the revenue allocation formula used at the national level to be able to augment to the local government. That's what is fair and is reasonable by any state government. But in addition to that, there is no state government, with due respect, maybe for you now that you are speaking for yourself, that it does not emasculate Collab cause forceful programs for, to be executed by, state, by local government, whether it is good for them or not. 90% of the projects that are executed in all local governments in this country today are done only as prescribed by the state governors, and they are dis dispensed of at the state meetings. There's no, no local government that are even pay salaries in his local government that I know. Quite a few of them, for instance, now, like Cardinal State, he came and uh, looked at the issue and, and reverted to what the, is expected of every state governor to do to operate properly. So it is more of the truth that funds that are due to local government councils in this country today are being mis have, have been seized by, all the govern by most of the governors in this country. They are either used for compulsory joint projects that, it may not be, uh, that uh, the, state, the local government may have not, no, no interest in. They are used for frivolous co uh, projects all over the country. And therefore, you cannot say that this, this joint account has any, any use to anybody. So if it is operated perfectly in bed, let's say, kudos to you, and we we'll expect that all your colleagues should be able to look to have, we should have a seminar and a session for what you have been doing to be, uh, to, to, and I challenge NTN to organize such a seminar so that data state come and, come and show uh, the remaining governors what is, I mean, other commissioners of finance, what he's, he's doing so that all of the governments can go. And why most of the local governments? Today, are talking about salaries and shortages and so on and so forth. It's because problems have been caused fundamentally by the governors. 90, most of the governors in this country today, uh, consciously or unconsciously, went to call, uh, create development areas. So a local government that had 2,000 staff before, or 400 staff before today, has, is, 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 is paying for salaries of 900 people, 1,000 people, 2,000 people. So it is the government, the state governors that have used their political uh, uh, conveniences to cause the problems for the state of government. If we have kept to the statutory uh, number of uh, local governments we have in this country, most of these problems would have not been existing because we have frivolous uh, ghost workers put in place because the governors have created development areas. Villages have become development areas in this country. So how do you expect the funds that are allocated even to cater for the salary? That's part of the problem that uh, the Nolge Secretary is saying. And the question of percentage, of course, in the state. 25%, you see a staff going home with 3,000 naira, 7,000 naira per month because they are paying in, per in percentages. This is a ridiculous situation that most states have found themselves. Uh, uh, all right, Honorable Kiana, we would like to thank you very much again for uh, your, your response. Let, let's come back uh, to the other guest, Senator Kapiru Gaya. Of course, you listened to the comments of uh, Chief Adevia speaking to us, Vasca from uh, Asaba, and uh, Honorable Kiana with us here in, in the Abuja studios. Mm -hmm. the, the issue, I would like you to take this along with whatever uh, reaction you, you have. Who is the competent authority to employ a local government 
staff. And therefore, are local governments facing a case of overpopulation? That's true. Senator well, Gaia. First of all, before I go to your question, I think I would like to thank the Commissioner of Edo uh, Delta State, <coughs> at least for explaining how they uh, run the system in their own state. But you see, the issue of project, joint project by state and the local government, sometimes it's not even fair. But I remember during our time, before we do our budget in the state, we invite the local governments, what kind of project do you intend to do for the budget of your own local government? And then at that time, we have deputy by the, which is the state the federal government had deputy during Babangida, and they were doing projects also at local government level. So we tried to specify, if we have three villages, in that local government, they need either water, health center, or other things. We will now divide the project into three. One, the state government should handle. The other one, the federal government through deputy should do it. And then the last one should be by the local government. So you find that there will be division of labor and contributions of projects at different locations within that local government. But this time, the joint account is really not helping. Much. The state governments are imposing projects in those states. I don't want to give you, I can give you examples of some areas where Roads should be built, dualization of a road in a local government area, which is not the priority of that local government. But because they are forced to do that project, they did it. And they are, they are taking their money from that account. So, and that is one. But you also have to look at the other scenario. Don't simply blame the governors alone for that. But even the issue of employment. The local governments are just employing staffs that they don't even need. So therefore, if you employ staffs you don't need, you pay them salaries. Because I remember, I just quoted some situations where uh, now, if you look at the amount of salary per the recurrent expenditure in the local government per the capital expenditure, it's almost 89-90% on recurrent and 10% capital. So therefore, even that 10% for capital, they are not getting from the, from the either being cut down by the states and they're doing joint projects. So that issue is very important that uh, uh, even if you change the revenue formula, which he said we could have done. We tried in the last... Uh, constitutional amendment, say, let's see how we can review the uh, revenue allocation formula. But we find that that's a very sensitive matter. To compute point dragging as even those small changes we want to do wouldn't work. But I think we need still need to look at the federal government is taking too much for 52%, and uh, the state government and the local government are sharing 48%. I think it's not fair. I think that formula should be reviewed, and I think we'll look into that. Then the, so I think you wanted to ask a question. The issue of employment, also, I just thought I gave you these reasons. The state government also enforced on those to be employed. After an election, you find that some people have served the, that political party well. I say, okay, go and employ them as uh, casual workers. I end up having thousands of casual workers of three, 5,000 naira or 15,000 naira per month. And the main workers who are, the main staffs who are really doing the job in the local government, hardly get their money. So I think we have to have uh, a kind of autonomy for the local government. And I think the, the, and then some people were saying, some state governors were saying that these people they have put as local government uh, chairman are not qualified to run the state. They are that a local government. It's wrong. Anybody elected, anybody elected by the people, that means those people have trusted that person to perform. So let them allow him to work. Let him allow him to disrun the money meant for the, the funds meant for the local government. And if you do well, he'll be coming back for election in the next few years. But if you didn't do well, then the other people, the people have the right to vote another person. So I think the issue of autonomy for local government is very vital, that the state governors should allow this local government to operate uh, on their own, and then let them see if the state, some of the local government have really problems paying salaries. But let the government encourage them to create their own way of generating revenue to pay their staff, or cut down their sides to the way they can pay their salaries. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Kabiru Gaia. I know that uh, Olorugu, uh, David Adewa, you, also, you, you want to react to what they have all said. But at the same time, I'd like you to also take along with it. When you spoke earlier, you, you, you talked about the fact that states or local governments need to look for new ways of generating funds. You are a financial uh, analyst. Uh, how important is it for local governments to begin to look for other ways of generating funds since the money that is allocated to them a lot of times is barely enough to even pay staff, uh, talk less of even doing other things in their local governments? Uh, thank, thank you. Yes, I, I think you could tell from my facial expression I was looking to respond, and I, my fear was you wouldn't allow me to respond. Uh, uh, distinguished Senator, thank you very much. Uh, you, 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 
I, because I, I'm more of a person that focuses on solutions rather than just uh, uh, to, uh, talking about the problems consistently. It, that doesn't help us. How do we solve the problem? And distinguished Senator, I'm, I'm glad you agree with me that what we require is a review of the revenue allocation formula. The Constitution, it's a, it's a provision of the Constitution that should be complied with. It says at least every 10 years. It's been 30 years. Why haven't we done it? Uh, that is the key issue as far as I'm concerned. As far as the local governments are, are, are concerned, you're quite right. Uh, and it's not just the local government. Every tier of government must do more to generate revenue in their, in their uh, uh, respective domains. Uh, so let's not make it sound as if it is only the local government that must do so. No. Even the federal government is struggling with salaries and recurrent expenditure at the moment. We, are, we as a state government, we've, we've done pretty well until uh, re recently. We've done very well compared to other states, but we're struggling. So, yes, we all have to do uh, our bit in generating more uh, revenue. And I know the local governments in, in Delta State have, have taken on this uh, issue headlong. Um, Lagos State, everyone quotes Lagos State as an example. Uh, Lagos State uh, had a jump on all of us because they had a problem. With the, uh, there was a time uh, they, the, the allocations from the federal government uh, were held back for reasons uh, most people know, and that forced them to actually generate revenue on their, uh, seek other ways of generating revenue. And that is why they're well ahead of uh, all the other states now in terms of, of, of uh, uh, generating revenue. Our time has now come. Uh, our local governments are doing the same right now. They're looking at, they've, for example, in Delta State, they brought in their own uh, consultant to, for, to, to, to help them. Now, in that, how could that happen in a case if we were controlling what they are doing? That's the last thing. And you must remember, the governor of Delta State is someone who was previously a local government chairman. So if anything, he was a local government chairman, commissioner, secretary to the state gov government, a lawmaker, a senator. So he has seen, he, he, he is fair to all tiers of, of government as far as this state is concerned. And, 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 and I, as a person, like I said, I've been around since 1999, would never do anything that will emasculate any form of government. Do not un unto others what you would not like done unto you. Uh, so I would not uh, uh, support anything that uh, emasculates the local government, and I, I because I would not want the federal government to do anything to emasculate me. But uh, a lot is being done, uh, but it will take time. That's the reality of the situation. It's not going to happen overnight. And you also have to understand that the very base that you're going to to try and raise revenue is actually suffering right now. Because at the end of the day, whatever systems you put in place, whatever new laws, uh, whatever drive. It was a critical
GMN. But Everything. Some water? It's cold, especially for you. Which air are you living in? We have a fridge. When everything else in your house is from the present, then why are your toilet cleaning methods from the past? Hapik, all in one for you. Compared to other toilet cleaners, Hapik removes top stains, kills all germs, and removes bad odors. For a shining clean and fresh toilet. Wow. You should also take the Happy all in one challenge. We intend to radically change Newman Street. My company has a track record of converting slums into new cities. Many years of experience has taught us to fish out allies within the communities we want to transform. Don't listen to your husband. Listen to me. Give me... The um, pensions of local government workers. Now we have still with us here the Abuja Studios, three guests, and we still have uh, Chief David Adevia, who's uh, joined us via Skype from Asaba. Another guest will join us presently via Skype uh, from out of uh, location. But in the meantime, we'll take uh, reactions of our viewers to the comments. Sorry. Jonathan says, let there be more ways of generating revenue and there should be accountability. Olajide BC, Olajide BC tweets, local government workers are finding it very hard to feed per day. Of this conversation. Kiani for his views. Are the local governments overpopulated with unnecessary staff? 
Of course, yes. Uh, the issue there is we're in a period of politics. We're in a period of politics. And any time a particular chairman is appointed, he may likely to bring one or two of his brothers. That one, that one is there. It's very correct. Because if you don't do it, the people will say, ah, you were there, what did you do? <coughs> Certainly, that one is there. But the main issue from the teacher's side that were imposed on the local government councils, they always Because the why, why the salary should always be on the increase, even if the person is is being conducted by the state government because the state government formed the committee. And what we are telling them is that if you really want to address the issue of ghost workers, it is not the state government. It is the local government that knows where the issue lies. Let them constitute the committee, give them the terms of reference to carry out the exercise, and they'll be able to arrive at the exact figure. Because if somebody is employed, for in, 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 take for instance, in Takum local government area, for instance, somebody is employed. Yeah. After some time, he's transferred to another place. The, the management have the record that they check. This man is, then what happened next? If his, his name is still on the permanent voucher, somebody that is dead, his name is still on the permanent voucher. So it is only the management. Just described the phenomenon of ghost workers. That was a subject matter we discussed on the program last week, uh, if I last Friday. But let's to come back to Honorable uh, Kiana. Honorable Kiana, uh, the point about overstaffing of local governments. Now, how does it come about? I mean, overstaffing arises if you have four, two or more persons, you know, engaged to do the job that one person can comfortably and conveniently do, you know, with a greater deal of efficiency and effectiveness. How do we begin to deal with the issue of overstaffing? Because if you do not have staff, you won't have salary obligation. And if you don't have salary obligation, you will have pension obligation. Yeah. Just like um, I had mentioned earlier, I was a local government chairman. And I need, just like um, I'm not in, uh, on issue this morning, it is not true that every local government com council chairman comes and employs his people or he must employ his relations of people that are close to him. I was a local government chairman for three years. I didn't employ any relations of mine on a conscious basis because it was a responsibility that I swore an oath to. And in the course of three years, I employed only 27 people, knowing that we didn't need to increase the salary scale, I mean salary, salary income of my local government. It's, it's on record, you can cross check. Kenya is three hours from here. But having said that, the foundation for overpopulation of the local government system lies squarely at the doorsteps of the governors. 
because most of the governors in this country today have multiplied the volumes of the local government numbers in the country. So if you are a local government system with 400 staff and they divide your local government to two, apparently and consequentially, the development area, because of politics, goes up to repl replicate all the structures that was in the original local government. What have you done? You have multiplied the volume of staff and therefore the salary income and salary requirement by two. And in peculiar one like Yana, the salary or the staff strength today is, is fourfold. Because you have a Yana local government, you have a Giza, Giza development area. The salary takes over 70 or 80 percent of whatever is going to come to original Kiana local government. It's divided into two to cater for this recurrent expenditure. Number two, sir. Most of what I thought the Nolge should be concerned with in how to reduce the number of staff is to be truthful. Because when some of the elements that when they discuss structural uh, uh, adjustment in the country or federalism and so on and so forth, it starts from us as individuals. All the Nolge officials in every part of this country knows that their members who are directors, senior staff, employed their wives, their children, their lost brothers, their dead brothers, in employment. And so they collaborate. And this salary becomes inflated. There is no local government area or development area today that you don't have this multiplication of staff put in place by the officials today who are suffering. Because you go to, you go to any local government today, you will discover that you have multiplicity of relations. You have a father, a wife, and his children as employees. Number two, sir, you have the, the evil thing that we call uh, uh, consequences of electionary promises. When you put people on this ad hoc job and start saying uh, 3,000 or 5,000 as a circle, it's wrong. If you are elected, you are elected to create a enabling environment for people to thrive and live their normal lives. You cannot give people the wrong impression that you come, you're going to give them a soft landing and start paying them something that's steep and that maybe makes them worse than the followership that they were before they became your followers. So thirdly, the Local Government Service Commission that is imposed, that is statutory by and managed by the state government are the ones that control the replacement of the senior staff. Four, the uh, uh, primary education boards that is managed by state governments are the ones that are responsible directly with the education secretary at the local government, are the ones that collaborate and employ teachers that you don't even have control over their disciplinary uh, actions over them. You don't know them, they don't report to you, but their salaries are paid by the income that was posted to you as a local government chairman to manage. Mm -hmm. So these are the areas that <coughs> we can only address if there is a functional uh, uh, resolution by this country to derobe the state government of any form of interference from the activities of the local government. I'm glad that His Excellency today is very sympathetic. I'm so, I'm so taken in by the commissioner from Delta State because he speaks passionately of non-interference. It should not even be in the details. It, it should be in the apparent state and in any form of it because all of us will be returning back to our local government system. And if we don't make it functional, for that long too will this country not be developed. We are talking of internally generated revenue for the local government and from the local government areas. Where do you get the IGR from? 90% of the people who are there are farmers. They, are, they produce, they make as seasonal things. There is no story, there is no good road. So where does he bring his uh, maize and make sure he keeps them for a long time to be able to sell it when the profit is there? Melon and Bihar they are forced to sell them at 10,000 naira per bag. In the next three, four, five months, three months, there will be 50,000 naira per bag. If the farmers have opportunity to store this and capacity to store this, in, then you would have been generating revenue at the local government area. So these factors have all made it impossible for the local government system to grow. And the place where this problem lies squarely is if the National Assembly, there should be no sensitivity, everybody is Nigerian. All senators and members of House representatives are Nigerians. All the governors are Nigerians. All the members of houses or assemblies are Nigerians. And today, they have not done better than any local government. And so, Mr. President, with his goodwill, I keep calling for this, must take this thing headlong and coerce these governors who come begging for salary and for uh, uh, payment of uh, whatever their dues 
to force them to go and cause the houses of, of assemblies in their state to give authority to National Assembly to endorse the resolutions of the National Assembly to give full autonomy to the local government system in this country. And until that is done, we cannot be treating elements when the source has not been uh, attacked. This is my position on these elements. All right, uh, thank you. Um, I would also like to know from you, as we talk about all of this, we're looking at the impact this is having on education. We're looking at this, the impact it is having on our primary health care. Because if you don't pay workers, they won't turn up for work. So, so to a large extent, what is the impact of this non-payment of, of local government salary workers? <coughs> well, the impact, uh, I said, is very serious. And this is why we have this issue of insecurity in our country. When the local government tier is the one that's closer to the community, to the people, and therefore that local government should take your responsibilities of that community. And when the local government fails to take that responsibility, it means we'll have so many idle minds. And it shows that if you don't keep people busy, either by employment or whatever capacity, they will make the government busy, or they'll keep the government busy, which means there will be insecurity. So you see, it is important we look at the autonomy. But you see, the autonomy we tried last time, even for the state assembly to get an autonomy. We passed a resolution in the Senate for Amendment Constitution of the last Senate, and it goes down to the states. We were expecting to get 24 states endorsing that resolution. We got 19. So we started campaigning to get the remaining five. Unfortunately, by the time we got two more, Three have written a letter to the National Assembly that they are withdrawing their consent. So which means even if the State Assembly could not get autonomy, how could now a local government get that autonomy? And you see, this is a democratic system. You cannot force people to accept the law. But you see, we just have to look at it in, in two ways. One. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, distinguished Senator. Yeah. Why do you think there's resistance to autonomy? For either the State House of Assembly or for local governments. Why? Yeah, for the State House of Assemblies, the governors didn't want the State Assembly to be independent. Because when they're independent, it means they can be able to do what they think best right for the state. <laughs> but when they're under the autonomy, when they're under the umbrella of the governor, it means it's difficult for them to operate because that's one. Number two, even the local government itself, when you are getting when the state governments are getting funds related to the local government and doing project joint, let's say joint project or joint account, you find that the state governors are still in control. But I don't have, I was a former governor, I don't have problems with that. When I was there, we did we act differently. With the state governors were receiving their self, and we are receiving our revenue from the state and local government are receiving their own. And we're also giving them 10% of our IGR to the state to share. And that's the basis of the joint account. Not saying that the money coming in from the federal government should go to state government account and then they share it. No. There is specific allocation for each state from the federal government uh, revenue allocation. So the only thing they are talking about joint account is the issue of the 10% revenue from the state so that they could share it. But you see, still, we have to also look at the issue of law government service commission and the issue of teachers. Yeah, before when the teachers were being paid through the local government, we found that some teachers were not being paid for years, for months, their salary. So therefore, the federal government says, or oh, the state government agreed that, let the money for the salaries of the staffs of teachers be with the state government and then let them disburse it. But you see, in that aspect too, if I'm a local government chairman, I don't have the opportunity to employ a qualified teacher. He's been employed by somebody else or another organization of the state to my local government. I will not have a quality staffs. People tend to do that because they felt that the local government employees, uh, local government chairmen and councillors are not qualified to lead. So this is one. And number two, we also have to look at, apart from being the autonomy, the percentage ratio where we get to the, to the local government. It's not a matter of the allocation formula increasing in number. It's a matter of utilizing what you have. Yeah. But unfortunately, when you have more staffs, you have less money, you find that 90% goes to the staffs. People tend to forget the chairman or governors or president being elected by the people. is being elected by the majority number of the people. So therefore, what you are going to do is to put your fund you are budget more to the people than to the uh, one percent who are generally the staffs in the government. Uh, all right, uh, uh, we'd like to thank uh, Senator Gaya for for his comments and then just to 
indicate again that we have another set of tweets. Uh, the first tweet that we are taking is coming from the Commissioner for Finance of Kaduna State. Uh, he's joining this conversation uh, via uh, uh, tweet. It says, uh, his name, of course, by the way, is uh, Suleiman Kwari. It says, Kaduna State JAAC, that's the Joint uh, Accounts Committee meeting, holds every month, and local governments are responsible for payment of salaries. I take that again uh, from Suleiman Kwari, Commissioner for Finance of Kaduna State. It says, Kaduna State JAAC meeting holds every month, and local governments are responsible for payment of salaries. Uh, this one is from Fix Amin. He says, inasmuch as local governments need autonomy, <clears throat> even the local governments seem not to be ready for autonomy as they don't press for the autonomy. Now, uh, Ogo Owaje twist. The major problem with local governments is that there's a general perception that local government chairmen simply can't be trusted with public funds. And Jacob Tunde says, whatever the story, the bottom line is, let the allocation of local governments be separated from the state. And uh, Ogo Owaje sends another tweet. He says, with the exception of urbanized states, most local government chairmen spend the bulk of their time in the state capital. And uh, Olajide BC says, half salary is the other of the day. The last half pay of May 2016 was paid last week. Pains, debt, hunger, uh, psychological disorder is here. And Ojo Olaiton, Ojo Olaiton tweets, a bag of rice is 19,000 naira, while the minimum wage is not up to that. And the affairs of uh, local governments are being controlled by states with one quarter salaries. And uh, this one is from uh, McKinney, Senior Apostle McKinney. He says, what about or your state where the state governor has failed to hold local governments, uh, hold elections into local governments? This gives room for uh, unaccountability of local government funds. Now, TJ, uh, TJ tweets, he says, help us in Quara. The salaries of our civil servants are still hanging. God bless Nigeria. Civil servants, you say, are they employees directly of state government? Our local governments. I concern this morning is where it's with local governments. Now, just to uh, continue with, with the conversation, we're back to uh, the, the General Secretary of Norgay, that's Mr. Joshua. Mr. Joshua, you listen to the comments of, of the other guests, uh, you know, who've talked about, you know, what needs to be done. From your own point of view, uh, what, what, what is the way forward out of this quagmire? Which it's not just a matter of payment of salaries, but also the efficiency of, local, of your workers and therefore of the local governments. Um. What I have to say here, the way out of this issue, I have to come into the area of internally generated revenue, the IGR. Most of the IGR for the local government council, the base where they will generate that fund has been hijacked by most of the state government. I can give you an instance of Federal Capital Development, that is FCT. The markets you are seeing within the FCT are being controlled by the FCT and not the local government around. Not the area councils? Not the area councils. You can carry out your research. You will discover what I'm telling you now is true. The same thing like in Plateau, even including Motu Park. They are the one controlling it, controlling the market, controlling the motor park. And where do they get the money to build these markets, like FCT? It is local government money. They say, let us build it. We will run it. After some time, we we'll hand it over. Now, after some time, up to now, it has not been, the markets have not been handed over to the local government areas. So there are so many areas like that that have hijacked the source of the revenue from, yes for the local government uh, councils. As we, as the other commissioner mentioned from Edo State, that the Delta revenue, State. I mean Delta State, sorry, no, that the revenue, <laughs> yes, sorry, <laughs> Delta State, that the revenue formula need to uh, be amended. Let it be amended in favor of the local government councils. To be honest, it is where the people are. But if the, local, if the federal government will have much money and the state government will have so much money, that is where you realize that there are corruptions. Where do you see corruptions? Federal and the state government. We don't even need to have states, to be honest. 
Because the state, the money they use, the money that goes to them, they, they siphon it. They don't do anything in the local government with the money. They don't do anything. The, is, there the any, is, is there any guarantee that if you had only local governments, the same but Malays would not try it set up? Honestly, if we only have the local government, maybe plus the WIC center, the federal, you will have uniform development, even development. For instance, Britain. Yes, now. You have been to Britain. If you see local government, A, you cannot, you cannot differentiate between local government, A, and these terms of development. All right. And mo I'm coming again. Uh -huh. More so, the, the local government council should be giving freer, uh, freer hands oh, sure. to... Just, just let me give an instance of uh, Netherlands. You know, uh, the uh, revenue base should be expanded for the local government uh, councils. Local government councils should be allowed to own an uh, 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 airport. Take, for instance, the Netherlands. The Amsterdam airport is owned by the local government. The, the largest uh, uh, airport for the in the U.S. is owned by the local government. Why can't we have the same thing here in Nigeria? Because of too much money at the center and the state. That is why you see pro, uh, corruption is being pronounced very highly in this country and at the expense of the people. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Iraq of Joshua, the General Secretary of the National Union of Local Government Employees. Let's uh, quickly get your uh, final thoughts, uh, Olorugu, uh, David. Uh, you've been preferring long-term solutions of reviewing some of the laws that guide uh, the, the, the sharing formula. But then we are looking for an immediate solution to the issue. What do you think can be done so that... Not, we're not talking about Delta now. Across the country, local government workers can be paid because this is having an impact on our, our, our system. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm afraid I, I don't have good news for you uh, because, uh, like I said earlier, there are no quick fixes. There are no quick fixes. Um, I listened uh, uh, very clearly to what uh, the distinguished senator said. I had no idea he was a governor before you, so I apologize, Your Excellency. I should have addressed you as Your Excellency first. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, and I've also listened to the Executive Secretary. Um, uh, I have to emphasize there's no quick fix. Um, this is a major, is a problem that is affecting not just the local governments. Even a lot of state governments right now can't pay their salaries. Uh, that, that is a fact. Even the federal government is struggling to pay um, salaries. So, uh, you know, we just need to go back to the drawing board and tackle the difficult problems. The elephant in the room is clearly uh, the, a new revenue allocation formula. Um, and what uh, my colleague from the local government mentioned, I, I totally agree with him. I don't see any reason why a local government cannot own an airport. Um, but that means you will have to change the constitution. Uh, 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 and, there, and there would have to be uh, a change in the revenue allocation formula to reflect this. Uh, if you don't want the state uh, uh, joint local government account, that's fine. But I'm afraid, again, it, is a, you, it requires a change of the Constitution. And uh, the distinguished senator has just alluded to how difficult it is to do so. Um, so, uh, yes, we can, we, 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 we can focus on trying to increase, uh, increase our revenue uh, uh, base in the local governments, but I'm afraid that's not going to get us uh, very far. Uh, and certainly it is not going to happen uh, overnight. If, if nothing, uh, the truth of the matter is the tax base is in fact reducing, declining. Um, you know, I, I always laugh because luckily for me, I've been in Abuja and I've, uh, before uh, and I'm back in the state. Sometimes, uh, you know, I think the air in Abuja is slightly different because people uh, sit in Abuja and prefer uh, ideas. But you need to come to the grassroots. You need to come and see what is happening on, on ground here. They, you will realize there's just no quick fix. So I, I honestly think if the call, my clarion call today is let us address the key issues. And I have no doubt we will very shortly because uh, some other uh, issues that rank parallel to them uh, have been addressed. Um, the oil price hopefully will go up at some point. But again, all that will do is mask 
the underlying problem. The underlying problem is that there isn't uh, uh, what you would call a, a proper alignment. Question on the subject matter we are discussing. Uh, uh, all right, uh, uh, Chief Xavier, we'd like to thank you very much. If you, gentlemen, we've spent uh, the, 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 our greater time of uh, this discussion dealing with unpaid salaries. The other leg of it has to do with pensions, uh, which we haven't touched on. Uh, very briefly, Chief Xavier, uh, does it appear that the pension reforms of 2004 have not had any impact on the payment of pensions to former local government workers? Well, uh, uh, again, uh, the Pension Reform Act of 2004 uh, amended uh, it, it, by the pension, or repealed actually, by the Pension Reform Act of uh, uh, 2014 uh, has taken us a long way and has improved the situation. Uh, but the issue of uh, pension liabilities is, is actually a global problem. For example, uh, the United States owes, uh, uh, has unfunded pension liabilities of 14.1 trillion dollars. That's about 40% of their GDP. The United Kingdom, uh, in fact, our former colonial masters, has unfunded liabilities of about 360 billion pounds. So it's actually a global problem. It's not, it's not, and so we shouldn't feel that this is just a Nigerian problem uh, alone. It's a global problem. Um, the Pension Reform Act, uh, if, if implemented, uh, uh, in its totality will help improve the situation. But again, the problem is funding. Uh, the, 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 there is a phase that we need to go through from the previous pension administration to the current uh, contributory pension uh, uh, administration that requires a significant amount of funding. And uh, all right, uh, Chief uh, David Adebia, that's too much that uh, we can take. We are pressed for time now. I would like to thank you uh, for being part of our conversation. You joined us via Skype from Asaba. By the way, uh, Chief Adebia is uh, incumbent commissioner for finance in Delta, and uh, previously was also principal secretary to the late president, Umaru Yaradua. Thank you for being part of our conversation this morning. Thank you very much, sir. All right. Uh, we also would like to thank the other guests who have been with us, Honorable Kiana. Always a delight having you. Uh, in our studios uh, for conversations of, of this nature, former chairman, Kiana, local government in Nasarawa State. It's my pleasure. Okay, we also would like to thank uh, the General Secretary of Norge, that's uh, Mr. Joshua. Uh, Mr. Joshua, we thank you for your contributions to our discussion this morment. Mm -hmm. And also the former governor of uh, Kano State and the distinguished senator, Senator Kabiru Gaya, he was chairman of the Senate Committee on States and Local Government. Senator Gaya, a delight having you as part of our discussion this morning. Well, thank you very much. I wish we had time to speak on this your pension. And yes. uh, it was we in the last Senate uh, were able to introduce this pension re reform on the Act. And I think that was good enough. But we don't have time to talk more about that. All right. So, so that's, uh, that's, uh, that does it for our discussion segment on the program. We'll go on now to our complimentary portions. And in sports, uh, Rio 2016 games, Nigeria crashed out of the basketball event.